Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. Uh, today's video is on Chapter 8 of Wolfson, and I'd like to open uh, the video with this little, nice little cartoon of someone sitting out under an apple tree and watching the apple fall as the moon is up in the sky. And so it's been said that, that Isaac Newton invented gravity or discovered gravity. He didn't. Um, Newton discovered that gravity is universal. And the legend is that one day he was sitting out under the apple tree, saw an apple fall, and realized that the same force that was pulling down on that apple could be the force that reaches all the way out into space and pulls the moon in its orbit around the Earth. Okay, and so the first two sections are just introducing Newton's law of universal gravitation. Next we have orbital motion, talk about satellites. Next is gravitational potential energy, now uh, generalized to the case where you're far away from a planet. And lastly, uh, gravitational field. And the, today's quote of the day uh, is that Newton's genius was to recognize that the motion of the apple and the motion of the moon were the same, but both were falling toward Earth under the influence of the same force. And we have a nice picture of the moon up there for you. Okay, so long ago, and this dates all the way back to 300 BC in Aristotle's time, but all the way up to Newton's time of the 1700s, the motion of the planets and the stars up in the heavens, uh, no one expected this to be governed by the same laws as all the rocks and dirt and worms and creepy crawly things down here on Earth. And it was Newton who first recognized that it was going to take a force directed towards the sun to keep the planets in their orbits. And he felt that that was similar to the force that the Earth exerts on an apple or uh, possibly the moon. So this Newtonian synthesis was that he was applying, applying the same set of laws to celestial objects as to things down here on Earth, terrestrial objects. So this is a big leap. And the law of universal gravitation was rather simple. It's just that any two masses uh, are attracted towards one another. Everything pulls on everything else. And uh, another way of putting it is every body attracts every other body with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating them. So it looks a lot uh, nicer in just one little equation like this. It's called, uh, like sometimes people call it the, the fourth law, Newton's fourth law, but it's the law of universal gravitation. And so if you have this object M1 and M2 out in space, and their, their centers are separated by distance r, then each one will act on the other with a force, and the magnitude of either force is g M1 M2 over r squared. And g is called the universal or constant of universal gravitation. It's equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 in SI units. And actually, Isaac Newton had to invent calculus to show that this law applies uh, not just to particles, but anything spherical in shape, where r now is the center to center distance. And just graphically, uh, if you were to make a plot of gravitational force versus distance, uh, it it would, uh, it would decrease as 1 over r squared. And so uh, since it's center to center, if you have an apple that weighs 1 newton on the surface of the Earth, the distance you use there is the radius of the Earth, which here it might be d. Uh, if you go up to 2d, so um, 6,000 kilometers up, um, so now you're twice the radius of the Earth away from the center of the Earth, now the apple would uh, weigh a quarter of a newton at this point. If you were... Uh, four radii, Earth radii, uh, up, which I think is about 18,000 kilometers above the surface, the apple would weigh one sixteenth of a Newton there. So let's see if you've got it. If you have two planets, uh, and somehow, I don't know how, you uh, doubled both of their masses, uh, what would happen to the force of gravity between them? Take a look, um, find your answer, press pause, and then I'll tell you. Okay, so it's B quadruples. So the idea here is the force is uh, G M1 times M2 over R squared. M1 goes up by a factor of 2. M2 goes up by a factor of 2. So the product M1 times M2 goes up by a fa factor of 4. Okay, so now we're on to section 8.3 on orbital motion. Um, 
fast moving projectiles are satellites. So satellite motion is an example of a high speed projectile. These sat, uh, GPS satellites or communication satellites orbiting the Earth are simply uh, projectiles that fall around the Earth rather than down into it. You need sufficient tangential velocity, meaning tangent to the, the surface of the Earth, in order to get into orbit. But if there's no air drag to reduce speed, a satellite uh, without any engines on it will just go around Earth indefinitely. That's how these things work. And if you think about it, uh, say, and this was actually uh, a drawing that was originally done by Isaac Newton in his Principia book, if you're up on a high mountain and you throw a ball to the right, it goes along and lands. If you throw it further, then it'll actually because of the curvature of the Earth, go quite a lot further than you would think, land way out here. And here's, you know, the faster and faster you go, it would uh, go f further and further until it's around halfway around the Earth. And if you threw it fast enough, you'd have this circular orbit, a special case, a particular velocity, or particular speed, where the path is a circle and the distance between the, uh, the ball that you throw and the surface of the Earth never changes, and then it hits you in the back of the head. And it's saying here, absent gravity, the projectile would just follow a straight line, right? So the gravity provides the centripetal force, which keeps this uh, orbiting object on a circular path. And so how fast do you have to go? Well, here's a little um, note, is that uh, the downward acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second squared, right? So uh, one second after a ball is thrown horizontally, we can find out what the distance is. It's d equals one half g t squared, uh, and t is one, so one squared is one. So this is uh, g over two, and that's approximately equal to five meters. And so no matter how fast the girl throws the ball sideways, slow or faster or really fast, one second later it will have fallen five meters below this horizontal line. And but remember the Earth curves, and the curvature of the, er curvature of the Earth turns out to be for every 8,000 meters sideways you go, you're actually going down 5 meters. And so question, what speed would allow the ball to, to clear this gap? If it's going sideways at 8,000 kilometers per second, then it will exactly trace out the curvature of the Earth. And that's an orbit. Okay, so not long before Isaac Newton, there was someone named Johannes Kepler, who was a German uh, mathematician and astronomer who looked at a lot of data of uh, observations of the planets as they orbited around the Sun. And he came up with three laws of planetary motion. So Kepler's first law is that the path of each planet around the Sun is an ellipse with the Sun at one focus. So what's an ellipse? An ellipse is a specific curve and one way you can draw an ellipse is to take a loop of string, loop it around two tacks on a piece of paper and stretch it out to a triangle and go all the way around and you'll draw an ellipse. And the idea is that the tacks there are the foci of that ellipse. And if they were both right together, you would get a circle. And a circle is a special case of an ellipse. And so by the way, the first law is that the sun is at one of the two foci of that ellipse. And then the other focus is just there's nothing there. So there's the sun, and this is the path of a planet. So the second law states that the line from the sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas of space in equal time intervals. And so what's being shown in this little GIF animation is two times A and B uh, that are separated by the same amount of time as you go around. So each triangle there has the same amount of area. So the planet slows down when it's far from the sun and speeds up when it's close to the sun in order to, in such a way as to keep this area always equal. Kepler didn't know why this was happening, but the reason is that when you're closer, uh, the force is greater uh, due to Newton's law, and so, it's, so it has to go faster uh, in order to, um, to stay on this path. And then the third law is that the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the average distance of the planet from the Sun. And we'll go over that a little bit more in a future slide. So we were taught in a previous chapter that uh, the path of projectiles are parabolas. Okay, so what we're saying here is that 
the tra trajectories are parabolic in the approximation that we can neglect Earth's curvature and that the variation of gravity with distance from Earth's center is, is not very much. So the real path of any projectile, if you throw a ball up and down, is actually an ellipse with a focus uh, in, at the Earth's center, but it looks like a parabola as long as it's, it's not, uh, not too high. So in a circular orbit, gravity is what's providing the centripetal force, mv squared over r, that's needed to keep an object of mass m uh, on a path of radius r around an object of much more mass, uh, capital M. That would be the Earth's mass. mass. So to figure out the speed, we're going to equate uh, the centripetal force equals the gravity force. Centripetal is mv squared over r. Gravity is gmm over r squared. Uh, the m's there will cancel, little m cancels, and v squared is going to equal gm over r. So you can solve for the orbital speed is the square root of gm over r, where m is the mass of the planet. You can also solve for the orbital period. t squared turns out to be 4 pi squared times r cubed over gm, and that gives us Kepler's third law, which is that the orbital period squared is proportional to the radius cubed. And it turns out that uh, here on Earth, if you have an object going uh, in a circular orbit, its orbital period is about 90 minutes, and that's if you're close to the Earth's surface. Okay, so when we derived gravitational potential energy in, energy in Chapter 7, we did an integral in which we assumed that the force of gravity was mg and did not change with distance. But now the gravitational force does change with distance, so it's necessary to integrate to calculate the potential energy changes over large distance. So this integration will go from r1 to r2, and the force is gmm over r squared, dr. You can pull out the factor of gmm, and it's an integral from r1 to r2 of r to the minus 2 dr. And so the integral of r to the minus 2 is r to the minus 1 over negative 1. Uh, integrated from r1 to r2, that's going to be gmm times 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. That's going to be your change in potential energy going from r1 up to r2. And so remember, we can take the zero point of potential energy to be wherever we, we want. So it's convenient here to take that to be when r goes out to infinity. In that case, one of those 1 over r's goes to zero, and we define the potential en energy of these two masses together as gmm, uh, negative gmm over r. And this result holds regardless of whether the two points are on the radial line, basically because delta u equals zero if you integrate um, uh, along a, a tangent or along a circular path that's centered on, on the big M. So you can always just use uh, potential energy as being a function of R, distance from the center of capital M. Okay, so the total energy of an orbit, which is the kinetic plus the potential energy, determines the type of orbit that an object follows. If the ener total energy is negative, that means the object is in a bound elliptical orbit. And a special case of that would be the circular orbit, uh, and also just a straight line path if you just release something from rest and it falls directly towards the center of, of big M. If energy is positive, uh, then that means you've got a hyperbolic orbit. The, the uh, path is a shape of a hyperbola. And if E exactly equals zero, that's the borderline case between hyperbola and ellipse, and that's a para parabola. And here's uh, pictures of all of this. Uh, you've got a uh, circular orbit. Um, you can speed it up and get an elliptical orbit with the uh, center of the Earth at one focus. If you go to uh, an exact speed just at E equals zero, that's a, that's a para para parabolic path, but it never comes back, it goes out to infinity. And any faster than that, it traces out a shape of a hyperbola. So let's do a quick question for you. Suppose you look at all these paths. Um, there are four projectiles all launched from a common point right where the red dot is there. Uh, which projectile had the second highest initial speed? I'll let you read through the answers. Press pause, and then I'll tell you the answer. Okay, it was uh, this one. The, the, 
it goes the highest speed was the highest energy was the hyperbola the second highest would be this parabola third highest would be the ellipse and fourth highest would be the, the closed circle okay let's figure out escape speed an object with total energy e that's less than zero is in a bound orbit and can't escape from the gravitating center if the energy is greater than zero then the object is in an unbound orbit and can escape to infinity so the minimum speed required to escape is going to be when the total energy which is kinetic plus potential equals zero kinetic is positive one half mv squared potential is negative uh, gmm over r uh, so you solve that out for the escape speed you get v escape is equal to the square root of two gm over r and it turns out that here down on Earth, the escape speed is about 11 kilometers per second. So energy, let's talk about energy in a circular orbit. So remember, for a circular orbit, the uh, centripetal force is equal to the gravity force. And so that was mv squared over r uh, is going to be equal to gm m over r squared. And you solve that out, you know, the m's cancel, solve it out for the circular spe orbital speed as square root of gm over r. So the kinetic energy of a circular orbit, uh, you can plug in V squared there, which is GM over R. The 2 comes down, and you get GMM over 2R. That's positive. That's the kinetic energy of a circular orbit, whereas the potential energy is negative GMM over R. And if you compare those two equations, you will see that for a circular orbit, it's always the case that the potential energy is negative 2 times the kinetic energy. So knowing that, we can look at the total energy of a circular orbit, k plus u would be k minus 2k. It's the same as negative of the kinetic energy. So energy of a circular orbit is negative gmm over 2r. It's always negative. And note that if r decreases, that means that the energy, uh, absolute value of the energy increases, but it gets more negative. So it goes down. And so, but also the velocity goes up. So if you want a satellite to spin, to speed up, which uh, you have to actually decrease the energy. It gets closer to the Earth and speeds up. Okay, let's see if you've got it. A moon is orbiting around planet X. Which of the following statements is always true about its kinetic energy and its gravitational potential energy? I'll let you look at those and uh, choose the best one. Press pause and I'll tell you the answer. Okay, right, so the kinetic energy has to always be positive. So that rules out A, it rules out uh, B, and it rules out E. So it's either C or D. Uh, the potential energy is always negative in a bounded orbit. Okay. In fact, the total energy K plus U is negative in, a, in an orbit, a normal orbit where the planet doesn't go off to infinity. And so definitely the potential energy is quite negative. Okay. So last se section is on gravitational fields. Fields are represented by lines radiating into the object. And what this physically means is that if you put a little point mass there, like a uh, particle right here, then there will be a gravitational force pulling it in this direction, the direction of these red lines. And if you put uh, the particle over here, then this red line shows the direction uh, of the force at that position. The inward direction of the arrows indicates this is an always an attractive force. And the crowding of the arrows, as the lines get closer together, it means that the magnitude of the force is increasing. And the way it goes is that if you plot gravitational field in meters per second squared versus distance, here's your 9.8 right at the surface of the Earth. Uh, if you go into the planet, it decreases down to zero because the pull from the mass of the Earth uh, below you gets partly can uh, balanced or cancelled by the mass that's above you. And in fact, uh, Newton showed that it's only what is within uh, this um, uh, your radius, closer than the, to the center of the Earth than you, that, that matters to pull you towards the center. And so that goes down linearly down to zero as you get towards the center of the Earth. Uh, and then as you go away from the center of the Earth, the gravitational field decreases from 9.8, and that's just because you're further away from the planet. And so that's that 1 over r squared law that we saw before. And that's it for Chapter 8. I will see you in class.